Okay, very welcome, uh, Jean-Luc. Jean-Luc Tifot, please uh, give us uh, your talk. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Renzo. Uh, so today I'm going to be telling you about random entanglements uh, via a model called winding of planar Brownian motions. Um, this is something I've been fascinated with for a long time, is understanding how things get entangled. Like when you have random, some kind of random process, uh, partly motivated by all of these molecular problems where people look at very long molecules that are entangled together. Um, and, and to what degree can they get entangled? I, I would like to get kind of quantitative results. Just of little applications for this. This is uh, Ray Goldstein a few years ago published uh, this nice work on uh, uh, the shape of a ponytail. So he actually has money from Unilever, I think, to study uh, entanglement of hair. And there's, there's some interesting problems with entanglement of hair, right? Like when you run a comb through hair, uh, what determines the resistance of, uh, of the comb as you try to drag it through hair? And it's partly the degree of entanglement of the hair, the local degree of entanglement. And I've always wanted to try to characterize these numbers. And I've made some progress, but I think that you'll see at the end that there's, these are very, very elementary models I'm going to discuss today. Um, another example that I've been working on for a few years and recently wrote a paper with uh, Randy Ewalt, uh, at Illinois and his grad student, Gaurav Chowdhury, is about hagfish slime. So the hagfish is this very interesting eel that secretes a slime. And the slime, if you look at a microstructure, it, it, it is made of tiny little balls of twine that expand very rapidly and then get entangled together and it makes a gel. And this happens in a fraction of a second. It, it, it happens rapidly enough that it's a, uh, it's a defense mechanism for the hagfish. Okay. so. Um, Right, the, the degree of entanglement of this, of this, of the, of the fibers in this slime should determine the microscopic properties of the slime, which is one reason to study, you know, just how entangled those little fibers, right? It's a question of how twisted they are under each other, both kind of in a local sense, but maybe in the more global properties. Um, carbon nanotubes is another interesting example where the degree of entanglement might matter because, um, people are trying to generate materials out of carbon nanotubes. But these things come out of a reactor and they're not ordered at all. You don't get to weave the carbon nanotubes. They just you take what you get. But if you could shape the process a little bit, you know, you would like to create perhaps more entanglement in order to make the material uh, stronger. And that would require an understanding exactly what are the right properties to strengthen about the material, to improve about the entanglement in order to make the material stronger. Um, another classic example that many people around here study is uh, the tangled magnetic fields case. This is from the Dundee group, um, an example of a solar flare uh, with a tangled magnetic field in between. And so you'd like to understand the degree of entanglement of this because it's thought it has uh, something to do with the release of energy when the flare eventually reconnects, right, is how entangled the flare gets because of the turbulent process at the foot points. Uh, this is a particularly nice model because there's this nice two-dimensional motion of the foot points, and I'm going to talk about that as the model in, in this presentation. Um, there's some more abstract setting where you study, instead of studying the entanglement of actual um, fibers, you look at the entanglement of uh, trajectories of uh, a dynamical system or of a flow. So these are floats in the Atlantic Ocean in the, in the North Atlantic. This is Quebec, where I'm from, this is Greenland, and you can see these floats that are released from a boat. And the degree of entanglement of these floats tells you something about the mixing properties of the underlying flow, underlying flow. So you can think of these floats as an interesting visualization of the flow, but because they're so sparse, you can't reconstruct anything about the dynamics, um, you know, by traditional methods. So these kind of topological entanglement methods are a way of extracting some very basic information out of this very sparse data. Um, here's another cute problem that we wor worked on a few years ago. So th this is a space-time diagram of some orbits. Um, in other words, these are a bunch of, um, each of these is a trajectory of something, and there's green trajectories and yellow trajectories. So there's two types of trajectories here. And so it's a 2D system, and I'm plotting time vertically. And the question to the audience is, what do they think this is? Sorry, this interactive thing doesn't necessarily work so well in this web talk, but if anybody would like to take a guess, it's data from some interesting dynamical system. And I would like to understand something about this dynamical system based on the data. And the answer is it's a soccer match, right? It's a football match. This is the trajectory of all the players 
um, as a function of time. This is Burkina Faso versus Togo um, in February 2013. Um, you can see this company, Opta, did not exactly want to give us the best data. Um, so they, they gave us a, a game that uh, they don't even give us the entire game. We only get the first half of the game. So they, they're really jealous about this data because it's very expensive and they sell it to football clubs. So one problem we've had in trying to, to apply these trajectory techniques to, um, to sports data is that um, sports companies don't want to give us the data. It's, it's very expensive. Um, so, but, so one could ask questions like, is there some particular characteristic about one particular football club versus another in terms of entanglement properties of their trajectories, right? Do they tend to be clustered in some uh, corners, et cetera? So, okay, so now let's do, do some math. Um, you know, my goal, of course, is to under, uh, understand this mathematically. And, and the simplest angling problem you can imagine is two Brownian motions on the, on the complex plane. So I have Z1, so two-dimensional Brownian motions, each of them has the same uh, diffusion constant. And so what I can ask is, what is the winding number of uh, the two Brownian motions around each other? So they're twisting, you can think of them as strands of some molecule or something like that. And you can ask, what is the, the, what is, what is the probability distribution of the winding number of these two uh, Brownian motions around each other? So that's a simple problem. You can simplify it even further by realizing that if you're in the plane, you can consider only the difference between the two Brown emotions. And then that's like one Brown emotion with diffusivity 2D. I'm going to drop the two because I'm still going to think of one Brown emotion. So in other words, there's one particle, which is the vector between the two Brown emotions. And now you'd like to understand how many times it winds around the origin. Okay. So let me just pause there and say, is the setup fairly clear because this is this is pretty important. So if there's any uh, quick questions uh, about the setup, I, I could answer them now. Okay, so um, the winding angle of the particle is some angle theta. It's a, it's a random variable theta, and it's the total winding angle around the origin, but it's, a, it's, it's not valued from zero to two pi. It takes value from minus infinity to infinity because you want to record the number of times You've been around the origin. Of course, the expected value of this angle is zero, right? Because on average, you're not biased one way or another. So you'd like to know the, you know, the, you'd like to know the full distribution and its variance. So this particular problem is a classic problem. It's due to Spitzer in 1958. Uh, for the MHD people in the in the room, this is not Spitzer from this is not uh, plasma Spitzer. It's another. Uh, it's the probability Spitzer. Um, and Spitzer found the time asymptotic distribution of theta to be a Cauchy distribution, known as a Lorentz distribution if you're a physicist. So in particular, the random variable, the winding angle, if you normalize it by log t, basically, it converges in distribution to a random variable, capital X, whose own distribution is a standard Cauchy distribution. Where here the only spatial parameter that appears is the initial position of the Brownian motion, the initial distance from the origin. Um, this makes sense, right, because there's no other length scale in the problem. The problem only has one length scale, and that's uh, R0. And then it only has one time scale, which is D, uh, D over R0 squared, basically. So the, the normalizer must involve this combination, basically, right? The surprise is it's logarithmic. The logarithm is interesting. Um, so that means that winding occurs mostly early on because the log t becomes very slowly changing after a while. And the reason is, of course, is because whatever winding you pick up, you'll probably pick up initially, and then the particle tends to wander off. And when you're far away, it's very hard to wind around the origin. So this log t signature is very indicative of the fact that the Brownian motion will tend to wander away from the origin eventually. So the normalized variable you can think of as being x over log t. Uh, a Cauchy distribution is a bit peculiar because it has infinite variance. Um, so it's a very ill-behaved Ill distribution. So large windings have a very high probability or an, a, an, a remarkably high probability. And this is a little bit pathological. Um, it is because you think of the origin as a point, as opposed, you know, as a mathematical point. It has no dimension. 
And that means that the Brownian motion can pick up a, because it has no scale, the Brownian motion can pick up a very large winding uh, around the origin initially. There's, there's a possibility for an infinite winding because the Brownian motion is a scale-free process as it comes around this mathematical point. So we'll see in a second how you can regularize this and, and get something which is more physically reasonable. So my claim is that the Spitzer distribution is very useful, very interesting, but I think it is physically uh, uh, irrelevant because you would ne you would never pick up these extremely large windings in any part of, in any uh, in any physical setting. So here's some numerics just to confirm to you that we can get this distribution by modeling Brownian motion. This is actually a little bit non-trivial because to pick up these long tails, you have to renormalize the Brownian motion as you get near the origin because you have to refine the scale. So it's a little bit non-trivial. Um, I'm going to be referring this, to this new paper with Huan Yu Wen that we just published where we have a lot of these simulations and a lot of the results I'm going to mention today. Um, don't worry about these comments here about GNF error and improved error. It's just we were comparing to some earlier model. And we have a very slight improvement because we're, we're asymptotically correct, whereas they had a small asymptotic error in their, in, their, uh, in their model. Okay, so let me show you how you would get this distribution mathematically. How would you get to this Cauchy distribution? Because it really illuminates um, the, the clever techniques that can be used to calculate these things. Um, so, first of all, um, you want to, one method is to translate your Brownian process into a partial differential equation. So, it's of course well known that Brownian motion has associated with it a partial differential equation, which is the heat equation. And so, my process would satisfy this heat equation with some delta function initial condition, which means that I know what my, where my particle is at the beginning, right? Whereas here z is the complex variable z. So the particle initially starts at z naught. So let me solve this on a wedge of angle alpha. So I'm going to assume that the domain is a wedge. So my, my Brownian motion starts at some z0, ends up at some z. There's a half angle alpha here. And I'm going to put reflecting boundary conditions at the walls. That's a very standard um, sort of advanced undergraduate pro problem or maybe beginning graduate student um, problem. And so you would solve this in polar coordinates. You would write down the Laplacian in 2D as Laplacian. You would apply uh, Neumann conditions at the boundaries. And then the solution would be a standard eigenfunction expansion and as an infinite sum over eigenfunctions on this wedge. But then here's the clever part. Take the wedge angle to infinity. That sounds like a ridiculous thing to do, right? Because you would think the wedge angle should only go from zero to, to pi in this case but you can open up the wedge angle and just keep opening up such that it wraps around. And what you're doing is you're creating Riemann sheets in the complex plane by doing this. You're allowing the particle now to go around the origin over and over again and treating that as a new piece of the domain. So if you do that, the, the sum in the standard eigenfunction expansion here can be converted to an integral because the domain is now infinite and you get an exact formula for this distribution in terms of this cosine transform of a Bessel function. Now this is not in itself very illuminating, but if you take the large time limit of this, you recover the Cauchy distribution. You have to do some subtle asymptotics actually even here to recover a Cauchy distribution out of this. It's not completely obvious. The key point is that this trick of taking the wedge angle to infinity, as I said, creates different Riemann sheets over your initial plane and allows you to count the number of windings. And Riemann sheets is just another name for the universal cover of the punctured plane. So there's a nice topological thing here where you want to consider not the initial space, but you want to take the punctured space and consider the universal cover of that space as the relevant object uh, to study. Okay. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pause again for some interruptions or questions because this, this fundamental example is, is pretty important. So if anybody has any clarifying questions to ask, now would be a good time. Okay. Right. So um, I mentioned earlier that there's a pathology behind the, the basic Spitzer problem, which is that the, the obstacle is a point, and so your Brownian motion can wind very rapidly around that point. 
and give you anomalously large windings. So fixing this can be done in many, many different ways. Um, you can stiffen the Brownian motion so that it's not allowed to create infinite curvature, for instance. Uh, another simple way is to replace the point obstacle around the origin by a disk, a removed disk around the origin, and then just putting Neumann boundary conditions on that disk. So it's a reflecting disk. And then the calculation is quite similar. You're solving again the heat equation on this on this function domain. Now things are a little a little harder. You get the same normalizer as you did before. One small difference is that the length scale now is no longer the initial position of the particle, it's the radius of the disk. So that dominates over the, the initial position of the particle. The initial position of, position of the particle is forgotten because the Brownian motion reflects several times around the disk. And your limiting distribution now is now completely different. It's no longer a Cauchy distribution. It's a hyperbolic secant distribution, which is not a very typical distribution to get in, uh, in probability. But the nice thing about a hyperbolic secant is it has exponential tails. So now all the moments exist. So you completely remove this problem of um, having a divergent second moment of your of your distribution. So as promised, uh, adding a disk of radius a really regularizes the problem completely. And in fact, this hyperbolic secant distribution is quite universal. So this this paper by Belil, for instance, is actually for a, a, a random walk on a lattice and he's computing the winding number on a lattice. And you get the same limiting distribution because a lattice has exactly the same effect of regularizing uh, the random walk, except that in his derivation, the length scale of the lattice spacing rather than the radius. Uh, also, there's a nice paper in the physics journal about uh, all of the different types of Brownian motions that I discussed. And here we have an improvement over this law in a recent paper that I mentioned. So the hyperbolic secant, I think, is a much more um, a reasonable physical model of the, the winding of a brown motion around the point. It's what I would expect to see in reality in some sense, like in a magnetic field or something. Again, we can check with numerics that all of this works. So this is again, your winding angle normalized by log T and the, the probability density function. And you can see, you see these beautiful exponential tails converges very nicely uh, in this case. Okay, so now what I would like to do is to complicate this problem a little bit. Um, I'm going to do two things for the remainder of the talk. One of them is I'm going to complicate the problem by putting a, a drift. So I'm going to allow the, the Brownian motion to also be affected by some drift term. So a, a, like a flow, like a fluid dynamics flow. And then later on, I'll revisit this problem with winding around more than one obstacle, which is the real challenge that I, I always wanted to solve. And now we've made some progress towards it. So let's talk about drift first. What I mean is that so far we've got pure Brownian motion, so there's no particular direction that the Brownian motion prefers. But a natural thing to do, especially if you're a fluid dynamicist, is to add a, a drift. So what I mean here is this is an angular rotation rate, right? So I've got my heat equation as before, but I've got an angular rotation rate omega here, which tells me that my Brownian motion is being pushed around a little bit at the same time as it's doing its um, Brownian motion. You would expect this somehow to be able to affect the rate of winding, of course. So in general, you can't solve this, not surprisingly. This is quite a difficult equation. Even getting asymptotics can be quite challenging. Um, but in some simple cases, you can, you can immediately discard. So for instance, when you take omega to be a constant, um, which is like a twit, a rigid body motion, that's completely uninteresting, right? Because if you add rigid body motion to the whole thing, you're just adding a constant, a constant drift, uh, omega t, right? So it shifts the entire PDF by omega t. So it's not that interesting. Um, so in looking for interesting cases, we eventually realized that the actually a very tractable, which represents a drift of strength uh, beta over uh, r squared, uh, in this case. It's r squared because it, this is one over r dp d theta, right? So there's, a, there's an extra r coming from the, uh, from the, uh, the uh, gradient in the, in the drift term. So for the point vortex, the decay of this drift is as one over r squared. And I'll show you in a second why this is 
analytic analytically tractable. But let me just observe that it's an interesting question then. You've got a competition. This thing wants to wind the particle much faster. But if the particle wanders away, the large R, then the drift dies down. So you only get this drift term when you're near the vortex in some sense. So the Brownian motion wants to take you back and forth near the vortex and away from the vortex. And the drift is really only effective uh, near the vortex. So it's not completely obvious how things will shake out, what expected drift you might get from this, what net uh, winding you would get from this drift. So the reason why this particular power of a drift term works is buried inside of the method of solution for this problem, which I'm not going to go over in great detail. But let me just say that this is a standard, again, you, you would solve this problem by some kind of transform method. And at some point, you would have to solve for the eigenfunctions uh, of the problem. And you get an equation like this. And the trick is that when you have a drift, this equation is still Bessel's equation, um, except that it has a complex parameter k here. Usually, the, the, the Bessel's equation is when you have either a real parameter here or an imaginary parameter for k mu. Um, the case of k mu being uh, complex, so having both a real part and an imaginary part, is actually quite difficult to handle asymptotically. But it's still just doing asymptotics of integrals, right? So, it's, so in other words, it's a challenge, and we wrote, you know, this is what this is what uh, is the subject of our paper that just came out. Um, but my point is that because this factor of r squared exactly matches the factor of r squared that was already in the Bessel equation, similar methods work. It's just much more difficult asymptotics. So that's why the, the point vortex is a, is a kind of special case. It is tied to the fact, by the way, that a point vortex is a harmonic solution. Um, to, you know, to the Laplacian. And so it's, it's quite closely related to that, that the fact that this works. So I'll spare you the details. I won't give you any more details about this. Uh, it's all done in gory details in our, in our new paper, which is in a volume on, on the, um, vortex dynamics and, and, to, and topological methods, uh, um, that just appeared in Philosophical Transaction, edited by, uh, Stefano Lovato and David Ritchell. So, the three cases that I'm going to discuss separately and, and fairly um, rapidly are the the big three, as I like to call them. Um, actually, maybe maybe now this is a good time to take this pause that uh, Renzo was mentioning. So, shall we, shall we pause for a few seconds and, and answer questions? Well, thank you, Jean-Luc. Very interesting. I have to say I have a rather childish question at the beginning when you mentioned okay. the uh, the riemann sheets uh, do you have any yeah anything like riemann katz information or something like that or not it's just it's just an riemann. extension of the um a riemann katz extension sorry about i'm not sure what that is no i mean i mean do you have I any just... any kind of information uh, from a topological viewpoint that you are going into um, a, a different sheet or something like that. Ah, I see what you mean. Um, yes, I mean, what I'm basically saying is that um, because you're selecting this wedge, go back, in the complex plane, you're selecting this wedge, right? And so um, you're, if, you, if you extend alpha to be bigger than pi, the only way to make your functions have the right kind of um, behavior in the complex plane is to add a branch cut in the negative axis here, right? So once you've opened up the wedge, Sorry. you're going to get multi-valued functions unless you put a branch cut. So I'm not sure if that's what you're asking, but whenever your Brownian yeah, particle, exactly. in other words, crosses this branch cut, that's when you pick up a winding factor. And so you transition from one um, Riemann sheet to another. I'm not well, sure if that's what yes, you're exactly. asking. So another, yeah, in other words, the angle, the winding angle exactly measures which Riemann sheet you're on. So this angle of theta here is exactly um, uh, a measure of which Riemann sheet you're on. So if theta is zero to two pi, zero to four pi, etc., you're just you're just you're you're moving from one Riemann sheet to another. So that's the thing: is theta Thank is not you. a yes, periodic exactly. angle. 
Thank you. Thank you. It's theta's value from minus infinity to infinity. Can you hear me? I heard. Shall I go with yeah. further? I, have, I, have, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Um, so, I mean, I mean following on, okay. friends, uh, this idea of opening out a wedge um, infinitely and having this dream and sheet structure is very reminiscent in the theory of diffraction to Sommerfeld's method of determining the scattering from a line, so a sort of an infinite half plane that stops. And he has very similar equation to yours, but whereas you're looking at diffusion, he's looking at wave scattering. So it sort of makes it um, complex oh. instead. It's giving Fessel functions, he gets um, sine integral functions, the core new spiral, which is of course what we used to talk about. Oh, I see. I don't, so I'm, I don't know if there's any, uh, I don't really have a question from that, but I thought it was an, it's an interesting connection with the sort of topology or the very similar. Yeah, yeah, no, that, sound, that sounds related. I mean, I, I, I think I would be surprised if this trick didn't work in some other context, right? Because whenever you want to record something winding around something else, it, 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 it's a natural thing to do, I guess. So I, well, I want, I'm quite keen to go back and look at that to see if a Cauchy-like distribution can be interpreted out of, um, uh, of edge scattering, which might be a similar topological sort of explanation. Oh yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear about that. Thanks. Any other questions? Is it fairly clear so far? I'm going a bit fast, well, I think. It's, it's, I find it easier to yeah. go. Yeah. If I may, uh, Jean-Luc, I have other, another little curiosity. It's about this uh, R squared. You've been sure. quite clear about that. Um, what about if you, if, you, if you move away from the power two? Uh, what happens? You, you lose... Uh, this property of yeah, so the, uh, having excitation. Exactly. So, yeah. So the problem is that you would get then two terms, right? Instead of having just the R squared here, which comes from, which would be there even in the heat equation case, in this, you would get another power. Cool. So there would be another term added to this equation. And then, you know, you could probably invent a special function that would satisfy this. I'm not 100% sure whether it would be still be sturm uville That's a big problem, right? If it's not, if, it's, if you lose some of the structure, uh, you might, uh, it might think, make things a lot more complicated. So we tried a little bit, to be honest, um, but uh, um, the student ran out of thesis time at the end. So um, I don't think it's impossible, but I think it would be considerably harder. You, you would have to develop now a custom function as opposed to being able to reuse some properties of Bessel functions, basically. So I'm not sure in practice how difficult it would actually be. We, we, like I said, we tried a little bit. We realized that it was actually quite difficult and we backed away slowly um, because there was enough to do with the, the, the point vortex. But it would be an interesting question. What happens as you vary the degree of this singularity is, is definitely an interesting question. Okay. Or an exponential or some other, some other function would be really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. So to go back to the three, the, the big three cases that I mentioned, um, there's winding around a point, there's winding around a disk, and there's winding in an annulus, which I haven't discussed yet, which would all say something around the end. So those are three natural domains to consider. And notice that now these have drift, and so you see that they're they're biased. Now you can actually see that they're they're all trying to wind um, counterclockwise uh, preferentially. Right, it's not perfect because, of course, it's a it's a light drift. We didn't put a very strong drift here, so it's just a tendency now for the uh, Brownian motion to to wind around the uh, the uh, the center. So let's just look at the results quickly for each case. Um, so the first simple case is winding around a point, and you're going to see some weird distributions out of this. Um, first of all, for the case of the point, we get a normalizer now. So the important thing is to look at how the angle theta gets normalized uh, in time. And it's still a logarithm, except it ends up being a squared logarithm here, which we haven't seen. That's not too important. More importantly is that the drift strength itself enters the normalizer now. So in other words, 
the shape of this distribution is actually linear in the drift, right? In the drift strength. So you stretch this distribution as a function of beta uh, as you increase the strength of the drift. So remember, beta is the is the essentially the circulation of the vortex, if you will, right? And so you still get a convergence in a nice way, but it's to this funny distribution. It, it's a actually you can say that x inverse converges to a, a gamma distribution, a gamma half half distribution. So notice this distribution has an essential singularity at the origin. So that's why it it plummets down very rapidly. So that, that's interesting. So first of all, it has a characteristic, an indicator function here for positive x. So this is maybe not so surprising. Um, you, it means that it's actually the, the probability of getting any negative winding actually goes to zero as t goes to infinity. Right. That sounds counterintuitive because it should always be possible for the walk to get a little bit of negative winding. Um, but the answer is, is the limit as t goes to infinity, right? It, 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 it removes that basically. There's no longer any possibility of getting any negative winding whatsoever. Um, so you can, you can kind of see that here in the numerics. The numerics are the blue line, but the numerics are finite time. So they actually have a slight probability of being, having a negative winding, whereas the, the theoretical limit has actually plummets to zero extremely rapidly and has no probability at all of being negative. But you can see the match is still pretty good. Um, there's a nice tail here, which is a little bit like a Spitzer tail in the sense that it's still possible to get very large winding around the origin. And these are even amplified now because of the point vortex, right? So if you do come near the origin, you're going to wind a hell of a lot. So these are very large numbers here. Uh, these are you know, these are very large uh, number of windings, if you will. It's hard to say what angle that is because these are normalized by log t. And here, px of x is the probably density of the random variable x. Okay, so first observation, a funny kind of distribution um, for winding around a point. Okay, and also second observation is no probability of getting uh, a positive, a negative winding. It's also interesting that you don't get a drift of the mean to the right, right? In the sense that there's not some time dependent drift of the mean. The, the mean kind of settles down to some fixed value as a function of time. Well, except that, it, sorry, it does move at log t because of this term. A disk of radius a has an even weirder uh, distribution. Um, this thing converges to a second elliptic theta function, which my student one, you noticed in a textbook somewhere that what he got was actually an integral form of this function. And so there it is. This is a second elliptic theta function. It's actually a derivative of second elliptic theta function. It's some standard thing if you want to look it up in a textbook. But the normalizer is almost the same, except that now, as expected, you're normalizing with respect to the radius of the disk that you're winding around. You're not normalizing by the initial condition. And secondly, you get exponential tails again. Oops. You get exponential tails of your winding angle as opposed to uh, power law tail. So once again, exactly like in the in the going from the Spitzer to the hyperbolic secant result, you're killing this possibility of extremely large windings um, by having a finite size obstacle wind around. Finally, the third case, which I had not discussed before, is the the annulus version. So if I take an annulus, which is a smaller radius a and larger radius b, it turns out that as soon as you go back to a bounded domain you recover a Gaussian distribution for the public density function. Um, the interesting question then becomes what's the normalizer? In this case, the 2a, where a is this logarithmic combination of the two radii, and it's linear in time. And it also appears as a drift term. So now there is actually a constant winding speed, a mean winding speed, which is linear in time, right? So, uh, sorry, the speed is ddt of a. So of winding. And that's because when you're in a bounded region, you're recurrent now. You, you don't leave the region. You don't escape to infinity. And so the, the point vortex has some kind of mean strength that is well-defined, right? You're just bouncing around the annulus and you're kind of feeling the vortex as you go around to some different degrees and things average out. I should point out there's a recent result by Gang and Iyer that analyzes this in the absence of drift. So they, have, they don't have the beta term. But then they show that this theta over two root a form is very generic. It works for any bounded region with an obstacle. 
So in fact, this Gaussian result is probably the most useful one for practical application because in, in practical applications like the magnetic field applications, everything would happen in a bounded region. And so you might expect that that would be uh, the, the dominant mechanism. Uh, it kind of depends on how much your Brownian motion interacts with boundaries, right? Because to get the, Ga the, 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 Brown, the, the Gaussian result, you have to interact with the boundary many times in order for the central limit theorem to hold. So you have to balance back and forth. Whereas in an open domain, you'll, you'll just leave. So it, it really depends on what, what time scales your problem has. Okay, so that was the last example of these winding around a point cases. Now I'd like to start complicating the space a little bit. Um, so the simplest thing you can do is to consider, for instance, Brownian motion on a torus. So take a, you know, the regular torus that we all love, put a Brownian motion on the surface of the torus. So a natural winding question is, how many times does it go around this way? And how many times does it go around this way? Right? So that's kind of the, the similar winding question as to the angle uh, in the single punctured plane before. And so um, mathematically, you're asking what homolo homology class does the motion live in? Right? If, you, if you pin the initial point, you know, some base point, and you wait a long time, and then you close the Brownian motion after a long time, you'll, you'll have defined a, a, an element of the homology group of uh, the torus, and you can ask what is the distribution of that element, right? So what is the distribution of number of windings this way and number of windings this way? So for the torus, this is actually a remarkably uh, easy question to answer, at least if you allow me to flatten the torus into its universal cover. The universal cover of the torus is well known to be the plane. So if I think of this little square here as being the torus with edges, opposite edges identified periodically, then universal cover is whenever you would cross a periodic direction, you create instead a new copy of the torus, right? And so the distance in this plane is exactly the number of windings that I've done in both directions. And if I come back to my initial position, that means I've unwound, right? So the original copy is called the fundamental domain, and the Brownian motion in the plane has the simplest Green's function that you can imagine. The distribution now is given just by the heat kernel, right? The, we, we know how to compute the evolution of a Brownian motion in the plane. It's just the heat kernel. But that's exactly the homology class now. It tells you that the homology class is going to be, you know, the, the two integers characterizing the homology class of how many times you wound around this way and how many times you wound around this way is exactly going to be the floor function of X and Y, right? Roughly speaking. Um, so asymptotically, we know exactly how these are going to be distributed, etc. So in this case, you know, there's no there's no um, point around which you're winding. You're just winding around the the whole space itself in a way. Hopefully that's clear. Um, feel free, for somebody, to interrupt me if the if the picture is not clear. So this problem is almost too trivial um, because it's very easy to compute. Um, so winding here are not actually going to increase that rapidly, right? In fact, they'll increase as square root of t. If you consider how far, how fast the Brownian motion origin is going to be depending as square root of t, right? It's the, the rate of diffusion of a Brownian motion. So square root of t here is the, the, the real rate of entanglement of this particular process. Okay, so let's make this problem more interesting and, and more complicated by now considering what we call the end slit problem or the end window problem. And this is work with Gage Bonner, who's a grad student here, and Benedict Valco, who's my colleague at Madison. He's a probabilist, so he's been teaching us how to do these problems properly. So the problem we started working on is Brownian motion in a square, but with, with a we kind of dividing wall in between. And here I put three slits in the wall, which we labeled minus zero and plus. I'm going to refer to n or 3, but the example I'm doing is for three slits. And there's a Brownian motion in this unit square, or size L squared squared, but the Brownian motion is allowed to go through these slits. Okay? So as a function of time, then, there's a small probability that the Brownian motion will you know, manage to slip through and entangle 
with the space again in, in a similar way as it was doing with the torus. Or you can think of these two segments here as points that the Brownian motion is allowed to wind around. The Brownian motion can wind in this way or it can wind in this way, but it can also wind in this way, right? It can wind around both slits at the same time. And now things are much more complicated. So it's like, a, like I just said, it's like a Brownian particle winding around two obstacles. By the way, no drift. I'm not putting any drift in this. Okay, I'm very happy to have Jean-Luc again. Uh, keep going with your talk on uh, on braiding, and uh, now I can see a torus. So please, Jean-Luc. Uh, Thank you, Renzo. To you. Uh, sorry about the technological mishap last week. Uh, so I'm going to pick up uh, where I left off. Uh, so we had looked at several cases of winding on the disk. So we'd seen how. Um, Brownian motion could wind in different ways around some points, either in a closed domain or, or in an open domain. Um, now we're interested in sort of bigger fish. We're interested about in going around winding of more complicated spaces. Um, so in particular, the simplest example that you can start with is winding on a torus. This is sort of a different problem than what we've looked at before, because in this case, there are no points that you're winding around. You're, you're considering a Brownian motion on the surface of this torus, and you're asking um, how much winding does it get in the, the sort of the, the longer direction and the thinner direction. So now there's two possible types of winding. There's the winding like this, and there's a winding like this, and the total winding is some combination of the two. Um, so a convenient way of thinking about this is what's the homology class of the winding? And what, what I mean by that is that you think of the space in terms of its universal cover. So here, the original torus is this square here, and I've unfolded it in the usual way. The torus is a flat space, so you can, you can unfold it easily and then tile the plane in an infinite number of copies of the torus. Now, whenever my Brownian motion winds around one direction, uh, that corresponds to, to crossing it over into another copy of the torus. So if I wind around the short direction, I'm doing this. If I wind around the long direction, I'm doing that. And so how far I get in this space um, is a measure of how wound I am. In other words, the distance in the universal cover is exactly a measure of how many windings I have this way and how many windings I have this way. And if you come back on yourself, that's essentially unwinding, right? It means that you've managed to sort of retrace your step and unwind. But the Taurus problem is actually extremely simple in some sense because we have an exact solution for the Brownian motion on, on a plane in terms of the, the, the Gaussian uh, kernel. So what it's telling you is that after a long time, um, the number of windings should exactly be dictated by the Green's function for the uh, Brownian motion on the plane. And so therefore you would expect the homology class, which would be given by the integer part of X and Y, to just be the number uh, to, to, to grow as a square root of T, right? Because you're doing a Brownian motion in one direction and the other, so your net dispersion grows as square root of t. So you would expect a winding that has a mean zero and a growth in the homology class, uh, the exploration of the homology class um, proportional to square root of t. Um, so one feature here is exactly like our windings around a point is that the expected winding itself is zero, right? In the sense that overall, because a two-dimensional Brownian motion uh, likes to return with starting point once in a while, um, you end up with a winding that's actually a net winding of zero. So you're again, not particularly entangled at the end of the day. You, you are picking up some tangles, but there's actually a reasonably high probability to eventually untangle yourself. This completely changes when you had more holes in the space. So initially when I started working on this, I was interested in the, uh, the idea of, of winding around say two points on the disk. So you have your two points and your Brownian motion now is winding around these two points. Um, and that turns out to be a fairly complicated problem. You need to use, look at the universal cover of uh, the twice punctured disk or the twice punctured plane and that's hyperbolic space. And uh, 
computing Brownian motion on those spaces is quite difficult. So with uh, Gage Bonner, who's a grad student here, and my colleague Benedict Valco, we kind of looked at something that ends up being a simplified version of the problem. Though at first it doesn't necessarily look any simpler. And that's um, Brownian motion in a, in a square. So here the domain is the entire square. And we've put a wall in the middle of our square. And we've taken out three holes that we call slits or windows in, in this wall. So one slit is labeled minus, the other one is labeled zero, and the other one is labeled plus. Though in general, we could have um, more than three slits if we wanted. And then the Brownian motion is reflecting on all these walls, except that when it gets through a slit, the Brownian motion is allowed to go through. And so eventually it builds up entangling. So this is actually topologically like a disc with two punctures, because this slit is one puncture, and the other, sorry, not the slit, but the, the wall here is one puncture, and the other wall is another puncture. So you're winding around these two uh, centers. And the reason why I use these slits instead of uh, uh, points is because of a single, a, a special property of returning to these small slits. See, if you compute the Brownian motion starting at a slit and you compute the time that's taken before you hit the next slit, it turns out that in the narrow slit limit, um, this is actually converges to a, a unique number. In other words, the time taken to go from one slit to another becomes completely independent of starting position in the limit of small slit size. Basically because your Brownian motion spends all of its time exploring the domain before finally finding a slit. And so it, it takes such a large amount of time to find the slits that the time to find the next slit essentially becomes constant. It's very long. It's logarithmic in the size of the slit, which is not that long. And it depends also on the area of the domain and the diffusion of the process. Uh, this capital D here is not the same as this capital D. This is the punctured disk, and this is the diffusion constant of the Brownian motion. Um, also, the slits are so narrow that it doesn't really matter where the Brownian motion hits on this slit. You can abstract away to a point uh, the region where the Brownian motion hits the slit. So all of these are simplifying assumptions that mean that instead of modeling the Brownian motion, we're going to model this as a series of hits on these particular slits. So this problem now is, unlike the torus, is profoundly non-abelian, meaning that if I go from the plus, the zero slide, uh, side, and then back, um, and then go to another slit, the order in which I do these things matters. So on the torus, because the universal cover is a commutative space, the deck transformations commute, um, on the torus, it didn't matter in which order you wound around which slit. But here the order starts to matter a lot. So in fact, you don't want to do homotopy in this case. Sorry, yeah, you don't want to look at homo uh, the homology group. You want to look at homotopy groups because you want to remember the order in which you've hit the slits. So again, we're passing from homology here, which is an abelian description of the winding, to homotopy, the fundamental group of the space, which is a completely non-abelian description of things. So now our... our, our mm -hmm walk on pi one remembers everything you do about the wall. So the angle here is not really a relevant quantity. We're not really looking at the angle uh, that the walk is making. We're just looking at which element of the fundamental group it, uh, it, it represents after a long time. So what we do is we break down the, the walk into a sequence of symbols, which represent the, what happens between the hitting times to the windows. In other words, if I start from window zero, maybe I'll hit the window minus next, and that I would write that symbol as A0 minus, where zero minus means going from window zero to window minus, and A is the kind of move that this is, whereas B0 plus is like going from window zero to window plus, whereas if you have a star, it means the same operation, but in the lower half plane. And then C is what complicates everything. It's all actually also possible to go from window minus to window plus, right? You don't have to have an intermediate move where you hit the zero window. Your Brownian motion can go around. Let me go back to the slit description. Your Brownian motion can go from the minus slit to the plus slit without touching the zero slit. So there's more than one way to entangle yourself. You can either 
go all the way around, or you can go through the middle, etc. All the combinations are represented. And so at the end of the day, you represent the history of this walk as a long sequence of these different moves. So, you know, you can do an A0 minus like I drew here, but then you can only do something starting with the minus symbol as your next step. Let me repeat that. What I mean is that not all operations are allowed. If I do A0 minus, the next operation must begin with a minus because I'm at window minus. So this is actually a groupoid in the sense, uh, in the algebraic sense, in the sense that it's, it's a, a rule for putting symbols together, but not all symbols are allowed to follow each other symbol. So unlike a group, which has a multiplicative law defined for every symbol, here you're only allowed to glue together symbols that share a last uh, sign and a beginning of the next sign. So notice that this is a plus with a plus, and then a zero with a zero, etc. And whenever the walk returns to zero, that actually corresponds to an element of the fundamental group now. Because you need to be closed to be an element of the fundamental group, right? The fundamental group is the space of closed loops in the space, and so you have to return to zero to get your fundamental group element. So you, you speak of a groupoid element until you hit zero, but whenever you hit zero, there's a projection from this groupoid element to the pi one of the fundamental group. But at the end of the day, um, the name of the game is the, is, the, is the same as before. We want to compute the growth rate of the length of this word or the length of the word in pi one. They're almost equivalent to each other. There's not much of a difference which computing the growth rate of this word as a function of the Brownian motion versus the growth rate of the word in pi one. The difficulty is actually keeping track of cancellations because you can undo something you've just done, right? You could go like this and then immediately go like this and undo your move. Or worse, you could go like this and then do a C, right? But then C undoes part of your move, right? Not all of it. So C, the, the move C in this picture actually contains two letters. It contains an A and a B because a, a C is equivalent to going through zero and then again to plus topologically. So um, the, the, the algebraic difficulty with computing the growth rate of this thing has to do with the possibility of accounting for cancellations. Um, so it turns out that this is related to problems of growth in regular languages, if you look at the literature. It took us a long time to figure out what the literature is that we should look at, but there are people that do growth of words in what's called a regular language, which is what we have here. Um, and again, I'm just giving you the punchline here. Not, there's a lot of steps involved here that Gage has worked very hard to do, but at the end of the day, everything is expressed in terms of a generating function for the last passage times uh, over these slits. And you can get an explicit expression for this generating function. And then from the generating function, you can easily compute the growth. So as far as I know, this is a the first formula that gives an analytic uh, formula for the growth rate of this thing um, on this complicated space. Because the previous work on this, uh, uh, on this in this literature which actually goes back to the 70s. There's, uh, there's work by uh, Ito and McKean, for instance, have worked on this problem in the 70s, the winding of a Brownian motion around multiple points. Um, it's very much uh, this pure literature flavor where everything is a bound on something else and nothing is computable. And so we really felt that we wanted to take a problem where we could compute the growth rates explicitly um, because explicit growth rates to us are uh, the meat of the problem, right? And if you want to have any hope of relating these things to real problems, you have to have explicit formulas that you can plug numbers in. So we're looking right now and finishing our work where we show how varying the width of the slits, et cetera, affects the rate of winding, the rate of topological complexity um, in this winding. I should point that there's a, a reference book for this thing uh, by Nechaev, uh, which is very nice, which basically explores many different uh, versions of these winding problems. A lot of the other work that I mentioned here is, is, in, the, is in the pure uh, probability literature. It's actually fairly difficult to read and also is very much, um, again, these asymptotic bound results and, and not very, not very uh, um, explicit. So that's about all I had to say. Um, you know, this entanglement problem is, is a very nice problem, I think, because it really includes so many different disciplines, right? There's the dynamics aspect of it in terms of what's happening in dyna topological dynamics, for instance. There's the probabilistic aspect. There's a combinatorial problem of looking at the growth of these words. Um, and one thing that we've started doing a little bit 
um, is instead of using Brownian motion, can use a motion that's generated from some fluid dynamical motion or for some, some dynamical system. And you can try to learn something about the complexity of the motion by looking at its entanglement properties. So we've done a little bit of work, especially with Marko Budizic, who used to be my postdoc here at Madison. Uh, we, we, we looked at what happens, for instance, in the blinking vortex flow of a ref, if you look at the winding of orbits in that flow. And you get uh, dynamics that look a lot like the Brownian motion because it's a chaotic flow, but they're sort of measuring some chaotic properties of the flow for you instead of being Brownian motion. Um, so, you know, the, all of this can be extended to arbitrarily complicated problems. For instance, if you have multiple Brownian motions and you want to understand how they wind around each other, um, this becomes a question of understanding the configuration space for these multiple Brownian motions, which is the kind of thing that Rob Greist, for instance, has worked a lot on. But then you, you take a configuration space, which at all the possible ways in which these two Brownian motions can arrange themselves without colliding, and then you consider the Brownian motion as a point in this configuration space. So it's really reduces to the study of these complicated uh, configuration space and their universal covers. The universal cover of the configuration space will tell you something about the rate of winding in this particular space. But in practice, of course, these calculations become extremely difficult. Uh, some interesting applications these days, there's, there's uh, some people in, uh, in particular in Turkey who are working on using braid dynamics and winding to study crowd dynamics. Um, the idea being that, uh, much like the soccer game that I showed earlier, the idea being that you have videos of people moving around in a crowd and you'd like to understand the crowd behavior by looking at how people are sort of dancing around each other. And one thing you can do is compute things like the winding numbers between the people, et cetera. And the idea being that sometimes you want to characterize the behavior of a crowd, you want to classify them in certain categories, or understand if there's a sudden change in the behavior of a crowd. And uh, with uh, James Puckett and Karen Daniels, we actually wrote a paper a few years ago where we did a similar thing with granular materials, two-dimensional granular materials, where you have disks moving around. We computed things like the windings of the different particles around each other. And with Michael Allshaus, um, we've been working on tools for analyzing sort of orbit data from, a, uh, say, float dynamics or floats in the ocean and trying to characterize, um, again, the self-winding of the floats or how they wind around each other. Uh, there's new work that I have also with Michael, but also with Tom Peacock, Marco Budzic, and Margot Filippi on uh, applying these topological methods directly to a, an experiment in fluid dynamics that uh, Margot uh, ran. So this is work that's about to be finished and submitted. So I'm, I'm basically done. I'll flash up my references here and I'll, I'll take questions uh, if, uh, if anybody has things that they'd like to ask. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jean-Luc. Very interesting. If I may, I have uh, a couple of questions and uh, please excuse me if I'm uh, very far from uh, your topics and so very naive questions. Um, sure, of course, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that you have in mind also. Uh, there is a lot of meat already, but uh, in terms of uh, optimal properties, uh, can you say something about this growth rate and some optimization, minimal or maximal aspect uh, related to that? Sure. Yeah. So I guess that's another branch of my work is the, the this topological optimization, where in some sense you're trying to maximize the growth of this entanglement, right? By looking at for the for the the sort of operation that entangles the the random motion as fast as possible, and in particular, the problem right. of winding that I showed today is more closely related to the problem that Phil Boylan did with his uh, student. Um, That's uh, right. Yeah, and uh, uh, Jason Harring Harrington, I think, was the, the student's name. Um, I think the only observation I would have is that the random thing is very far from the optimal thing. Um, the you know, the random thing has suffers from two problems. First of all, it doesn't always pick uh, the, the next best winding, but also it also untangles itself, right? The, the random the random process doesn't just have growth. It often shrinks for a while because it can happen to undo uh, some of what it just did. That becomes a lower probability event to undo more than one or two things, but it still means that you're still quite far away from the optimal solution if you start backtracking. Uh, so right. so the, the random solutions tend to be quite far away from the optimal solutions, I would say. And is any of this related to, you know, um, you, you mentioned the three slits problem. Why, first of all, three? 
and not two or four. I mean, well, what, so is any relationship between the number of slits and some uh, ordering emerging <laughs> from random motion? So let me say that it's called the three set problem, but it's only it's actually the two winding center problem, right? Because there are three slits, but if you think about it, you're only winding around these two walls, right? Right. Hopefully, hopefully I'm still, am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Um, yes. So, so that's the answer to your first question is that it's actually two, right? So in other words, one is too simple that, or is simple, but we talked for the first, first half of the talk was all about one. So this is actually just going that's from one to two which is fairly natural, right. you'll agree with me. And then yeah. N windows doesn't actually change the problem all that much. Going from one to two changes everything because it goes from being abelian to non-abelian universal cover. So, you know, now you get irrevocable entanglement. In other words, the, the, the expected entanglement doesn't actually go to zero in the, in the two slits and more problems. So there's a, there's a drastic change in going from uh, one point of, to entangle around to two points to entangle around. But after that, going to higher n, there isn't a particularly uh, radical difference. Um, and I don't know that there's, I don't have any particular interpretation for, you know, the number of slits to me becomes a kind of less interesting quantity after that. We would be interested to see if we can compute some things in the limit as a, with a large number of slits, because as you know well, very often, you can do things for small numbers and for large numbers. So we've thought a little bit about going to a limit where you have an an infinite number of slits or something like that, like a periodic lattice or something like that. And then you might be able to do some work. Um, there's a little bit of that in the book by Nechayev as well on, on periodic lattices, entangling in periodic lattices. I was, I was just wondering if there is an overlap in the asymptotics when you go for either a large number of slits and the, and the, and the typical width of the slits that you said is so crucial. That's why. It's only crucial. Wondering. So it's, Right now, the, the width is um, only crucial in the sense that otherwise we can't solve the problem, right? So, so it's not a, it, it doesn't play a particularly strong role, the width of the slits. It just determines the times it takes to go from one, uh, one, one slit to the other. The only reason we took this limit is because otherwise, mathematically, we're not justified in doing what we're doing, right? In other words, we, yeah, sure. if, you, if, you, if you make the slits wider, then you have to start looking at the measure of hitting on the slits, and it's not uniform, meaning if I start from this slit and I go to this slit, I don't hit this slit uniformly, right? And so I have to integrate over the distribution of hittings, uh, you know, the measure on the surface of each slit, and that just becomes too tedious and complicated, in other words. Then, then you really can't compute anything again, and you're back to these um, not very explicit results. But I still believe that this approximate formula for narrow slits should, should actually hold for even reasonably wide slits, I think. Like, you should get pretty close to good quantitative results, even for slits that are slightly wider. Yeah. Well, and I have a really, actually, uh, the simplest uh, question of all is, uh, if you had any application in mind when you consider motion on the torus. Um, no, I the, the torus. thinking of. No, not particularly. You know, you know, I mean, in... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so the, the multiple slit problem, one application we have in mind is just thinking of these, um, you know, molecular coiling problems, right? In the sense that if you have, if you have a long molecule and, and it can only enter through a handful of slits, you, you could ask what's the probability that it'd be entangled. Here, mm -hmm. the slits being other molecules, perhaps, right? If you have a small gap. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that I don't have any particular idea of what the torus could be for. It was more of an example that bridge the gap between winding around one point and winding around multiple slits, right? So it's a, it's a nice intermediate example that can be solved analytically. Um, don't have a good feel for what would be a good, uh, uh, you know, application to the torus. Yeah. Well, perhaps uh, should... Dewitt uh, would, uh, would give you some advice. There are lots of uh, cases in biology where, well, I'm, I'm now not, uh, certainly not an expert, but I'm thinking of like a ball with a lot of holes where you are wondering uh -huh. the probability to get out or in uh, by random motion, that's all. <laughs> I see. Okay, yeah, that could be related. I should point out, as soon as you put even one obstacle in the torus, then it becomes mm -hmm. more like the three slit problem. Um, because mm -hmm. if you if you make one obstruction on the torus, it becomes non-abelian again, and everything becomes mm -hmm. much more like the other description that I mentioned. So 
it has to be the plain torus with no obstacles on it. Otherwise, it actually becomes as complicated as the other case. Well, thank you very much, Jean-Luc. My pleasure. Again, sorry about the mishap from the first lecture. Hopefully, no, they can be no glued problem. together relatively seamlessly. But thank you to, to all of you to uh, do this twice. Um, that's heroic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.